What did we learn during our study of Romans? This is the question we seek to answer today as we conclude our study of the book of Romans on walking through the Bible. We have now come to the 38th and final lesson in our study of Romans. If you've missed any lessons or would like to rewatch this series, you can find all of them at eastendchurch.org by searching under the media pull-down menu for the WTTB English podcast link. So having now completed our verse-by-verse study of Romans, it is a good time to reflect upon what we have learned. The book of Romans is the first epistle that we've encountered in our walk through the Bible and the first of 13 identified epistles of the Apostle Paul. An epistle is a letter, and in the Bible context, it is a letter written either to a church or an individual exhorting them to continue in the faith, as well as answer any doctrinal questions that may have arisen. In the case of the church in Rome, the Christians this letter was written to, the theme centered around the vital question as to how sinners are restored to a right relationship with God. Is it through the law, which many times in Romans is referring to the law of Moses, or is it by grace through faith in Jesus Christ? revealed to us by the gospel. The answer to this question is of most importance for us today, for it determines not only how God saved us, but how we become a Christian. Unfortunately, this theme is often forgotten by today's readers who use it to teach the false doctrines of Calvinism, including the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. In actuality, what Paul taught throughout is the just shall live by faith in Christ, delivered through the gospel, God's power to salvation, to everyone who believes, according to Romans 1, 16 and 17. In order to demonstrate this, Paul first had to show that everyone was in need of a Savior because all have sinned. Paul does this in Romans 1 and 2 by showing the Gentiles that they lived in all sorts of sin by abandoning God and serving idols. Thus, God gave them up so that they could fulfill those desires, which of course led to all sorts of other grotesque sins. God could hold the the Gentiles accountable for those sins, even without the law of Moses, because God did give the Gentiles a law, the law he gave Noah after the flood, and a law that convicted them of sins like murder, lying, stealing, etc. Thus, since they sinned in those regards, they could be held accountable for their actions by God as far as being held responsible for the things that they could know. They were not held accountable for breaking all of the ordinances of the law of Moses, like the sacrifice, priests, food laws, cleanliness laws, etc., because those laws weren't given to them. But lest the Jews think of themselves as so righteous because they had the law of Moses, they weren't, because they broke that law. They stole, they lied, they committed adultery, they sinned. Did the law deal with sin in order to provide remission? No. Sure, there were animal sacrifices, but in Hebrews we will learn that the blood of bulls and goats could not remit sin. So if the law couldn't remit sin, it was impossible to be saved by that law. But even with that being told to the Jewish Christians by Paul, they should have already known that. For how was Abraham, the father of the Jews, saved? He wasn't saved by the law of Moses, for that wouldn't exist for over five centuries after his death. No, Abraham was saved by faith in God, a faith that obeyed. And that's where Calvinists and most people professing to be Christians today get things wrong. They read that Abraham was saved by faith and conclude it was by faith alone. The verse Paul quotes, though, is Genesis 15, verse 6, a verse that refers to a time long after Abraham was called. Abraham in faith has been obeying God by leaving Ur, the land of Ur, and going to Canaan and walking by faith since then. It is thus an obedient faith in what God has told us to do that will justify us, not simply belief alone. The reason that Abraham needed to be saved in the first place, though, is because all sin and fall short of the glory of God, both Jew and Gentile. Thus, all earn the wages of sin, which is death. Sin entered this world by one man, Adam. However, we do not inherit some sin nature from Adam, as Calvinists teach today. Death spread to all men, according to Romans 5, verse 12, because all sin. Righteousness, though, entered into this world by one man, too, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Everyone doesn't become a sinner because of Adam. Neither does everyone become righteous because of Christ. We become a sinner when we sin, and we become righteous when we in faith die to sin in the waters of baptism, being raised to walk in newness of life by the power of God who cleanses us from our sins. No, there's no magic in the water, for it is because of the blood of Christ that we can be reconciled back to God. And no, baptism is not a work of man that earns our salvation. It is a work of God. 
And it is the it is at the that point that our faith has responded to the word of God and obeyed God. So it is the point that God forgives us our sins and declares us righteous. He does this for both the Jew and the Gentile the same way. But even though God declares us righteous, our walk is not over. We must shun sin and become slaves of righteousness, continuing to obey what God tells us to do. If we do so, we will have peace with God, reconciliation with God, the hope of eternal life, and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, for all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. No, this passage in Romans 8.28 doesn't mean that every bad thing that happens to us, God will turn around and make it good. It means that all things that God has purposed is for our good, which includes salvation in Christ, the church, and whatever else God chooses to rot. To the Jews, such a system of salvation could feel like spiritual adultery, for they were being asked to give up the law of Moses and be conformed to Christ and the new covenant. Isn't that something similar as to what got Israel and Judah in trouble during the days of the kings, going after other gods and forms of worship? Except they forgot one thing. Christ came to fulfill the law, to properly interpret and complete it. The old law spoke of a prophet like unto Moses, whom the people needed to hear. And that prophet, that deliverer and lawgiver, was Jesus. Thus, when Christ died on the cross, the law of Moses died, freeing the Jewish Christians to be married to another, Christ. This would not be spiritual adultery, for once the husband dies, you are no longer bound to the law of your husband, but are free to marry another. Some of the Jews did this, but many did not. Does that mean that God had outright rejected the Jews? No, because, but he won't save them if they reject Christ, the Messiah that he sent for them. You see, God chose Israel as the nation through whom the Messiah would come. That was the election of Romans 9. It was an election for the production of the Messiah, not an election for salvation. We should know this because many of the kings in the lineage of Jesus were wicked, and yet the Messiah still came through them. God, as creator, can choose how to save man, and he did so through Christ. Thus, as long as Israel, on the whole, wanted to reject Jesus, God would allow them to remain in this stupor. But it didn't, and it doesn't have to be this way. They can obey Christ and be saved, but it will be just as everyone else does, by faith in Christ Jesus. And how does one obtain faith? Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, according to Romans 10:17. And a faith that responds to the gospel is one who will confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is not the sinner's prayer or simply mental assent. This is a calling on the name of the Lord to save us. Something Acts 22.16 reveals to us occurs at baptism when we obey God's commands. This outpouring of God's love that we didn't deserve should cause the Christian to do something. It should cause us to present our bodies to God as living sacrifices, which is our reasonable service. That means that we will fulfill our role in the church. We will show love and devotion to our brethren, and we will bless our enemies, and we will submit to our government. In all things, we will live a life of service to God, showing our gratitude and confidence in our salvation by faith. We won't divide over opinions where an opinion isn't over a matter of right and wrong, but over a preference in which either preference is right. Such would be wrong and harmful to the body of Christ. Instead, Christians will serve one another, thinking of others more highly than themselves. That is some hard teaching by God here, and it sets a high standard, but it is a reasonable standard, one that we can reach through Christ. As for the author of Romans, uh, it claims to be authored by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and the evidence in this book to support this is overwhelming. For instance, the author claims that he is a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul was those things. The author claims to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was that. The author claims to have been a companion of Aquila and Priscilla, something we saw Paul doing back in our study of the book of Acts. The author also claims that he was in the process of taking a financial contribution to the needy saints in Jerusalem, something again we saw of Paul near the end of the book of Acts. All of these things provide very strong evidence that when the letter begins with Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, that Paul is the author of this book. And then, of course, for the date when this book was written, Paul had not yet visited the saints in Rome, so that means that the book predated his imprisonment there, which took place between 60 to 63 AD. 
Within the book itself, there is plenty of evidence that places Paul in Corinth during the writing of this book, for he included greetings from his host Gaius, who Paul baptized in Corinth. He also sent greetings from Erastus, who served as the city treasurer of Corinth, as well as from Timothy and Sospitar, men who accompanied him at the time he was in Corinth in Acts 20, verse 4. And then, of course, there is mention of him in the process of traveling to Jerusalem to bring funds for the needy saints there. Acts 20 verse 3 would say that Paul would stay three months in Greece, of which Corinth is included, and so it is likely that Romans was written then, which would place the writing around 57 to 58 AD. In closing, I consider the book of Romans to be the hardest of all the New Testament books, even the book of Revelation, due to its heavy, fo heavy focus on doctrinal teaching. It is twisted by many to teach things it doesn't, which again is testament to its difficulty but it could be understood with careful study, and I hope each one who has watched all the way through has developed a deeper understanding and a deeper appreciation for the salvation we have in Christ. And if you're not a Christian, it is my sincere hope that you become one according to the Scriptures by believing in Jesus, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, which will lead you to be baptized for the remission of sins. If you do this, then you too can have the hope of heaven and not fear the condemnation that is to come for those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that, then, we conclude our study of the book of Romans. The Lord willing, in the next lesson, we will be returning to the Old Testament and begin our study of the book of First Chronicles with an introduction to that book. We hope that you will join us for that discussion as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Amen.